Hi there, and welcome to Conservation in the Classroom, where you get the chance to learn from and interact with real conservation experts from WWF. My name is Kate, and I am your host. And today's topic is all about fresh water, specifically rivers, and why it is so important for rivers to remain flowing freely. And here to teach us a little bit more about that today is Natalie Shabol with WWF's freshwater team. Natalie is a freshwater specialist whose work focuses on protecting large rivers all around the world, like the Mekong River in Asia, to make sure that these rivers stay nice and healthy. So Natalie, thank you so much for being here. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here today. So before I kick things over to Natalie officially, uh, of course, we need to say hello to our special guests that we have joining us on camera. So let's bring them in one at a time. First up from St. Charles, Missouri, we have the Academy of the Sacred Heart. Welcome, everybody. Hi. Next, we have our Red Devils from East Jordan Elementary, fifth grade in the Great Lakes region. Hi, you. <laughs> Next, we have Miss Kudrick's fifth grade PM class. Welcome, Mrs. Kudrick's class. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, joining us from the Carolinian Forests of Canada. They are a nature club involved in restoration projects, species protection, and spreading education. The Green Herons from the Niagara region. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we are thrilled to have you all here and cannot wait to hear your questions for Natalie. Just a quick reminder to those of you watching live on the web page, please place any question that you have in the Google form that you see underneath the video, and we will get as many of those questions answered as we can at the end. So without further ado, I think we're ready to hand it over to Natalie. If you want to go ahead, Natalie, and get your slides up, and then you can take it from here. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Natalie Shabol, and I am really happy to be here with you all today to share a little bit about myself and my work at WWF. Um, it's going to be hard to match the energy that you all showed, um, but I will try to present with as much enthusiasm as you all showed. Um, and today, my presentation is on why rivers need to flow. And I wanted to start a little bit about myself back in the day when I first started becoming interested in nature and water. And I it started when I was pretty young. Um, mostly first, I was exposed to a lot of animals. My dad loves animals. We had chicken, dogs, turtles, fish, all of those types of animals um, that I grew up around. So I became interested in animals and different living things. Um, and I love to be outside. Sorry, did I hear somebody? No, I was just going to say, I think you're still in the slide mode if you want to put it in full screen. I am in full screen. Oh, let's see. I'll try again. How about that? Um, I think we can still see the slides on the left. Um, you might be sharing the wrong window, but that's okay. Okay, let me see. Uh, window. Is that better? Hello? Still see the slides. Oh, we can still see the slides on the left, but it's okay. You can, we can see them. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I just to continue, I, um, became curious and enjoyed learning about animals and being outside and Here's a typical photo of me barefoot out in a tree in our yard. Um, and then I grew up in a place where the summers were really hot. So I love to swim and, you know, swimming brought great relief to myself in the hot summer days. Um, and so I always loved water since then. And whenever I was about 10 years old, as you can see in this picture, um, I got to visit the Grand Canyon, the first national park I got to go see. And at the time, I wasn't so aware, but the Colorado River that runs through and shapes the Grand Canyon was the water that I relied on and continue to rely on um, in my home of Los Angeles, where I grew up and live in now. But 
they, as the years have gotten drier, we've had longer droughts or periods of time where there isn't enough or water as it usually comes um, historically, uh, the Colorado River and all that it provides to has become stressed. So um, it, it became more interesting to me having firsthand experience um, this type of water shortage. And then because I was exposed to animals so much, I thought I might be a veterinarian. But then when I went to college, I learned about different careers and learned about this thing called environmental science and how the, how the environment and nature connect to each other. Natalie, sorry to jump in. I don't think the slides are advancing. Okay. We're still on slide one of, yeah. Um, um, so you have them in full screen mode on your Yeah, monitor. I did the same thing I did before. Um, how about this? Let's try Let one me. more time here. How about this? Yes, that I think is working. Okay. Do you see the education slide? Yes, we're good. Okay. Here is the slide. Here's the first slide of me as a young kid. This is me at about 10 years old at the Grand Canyon. And here is my education slide. Are we back at the education slide? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. Everything. I just good. wanted to Sorry. test it. Um, so, as I was saying, I, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. Then I learned that there is this career called environmental science, and it's the connection between humans and nature. Um, and so, whenever I learned that that was a possibility, that's what I wanted to do. And so now I have a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science from the University of California, Los Angeles, and a Master of Environmental Science and Management from the University of California, Santa Barbara. At the time when I was in college in my hometown, we had a little rainfall, like I, ma I mentioned, a drought or a period when there's unusually dry and water for everyday use has to be conserved and used very wisely. Because of the drought going on, my interest in water issues peaked and there were opportunities to learn and work on it while I was there. After college and during my graduate studies, I continued to learn not only about droughts, but how water and what we put into water impacts our communities. These photos are some of the experience I've had in school. So on the left is uh, me cleaning some turtle water on the roof of a building. Um, I was a part of a group project and we had to take turtles out of a river because of how dry the water was and there wasn't good enough water quality for the turtles to live in that river. And then the picture on the right is um, a picture of me in the field during my graduate studies. Um, and I was taking pictures and photographs during the, my field studies there. Um, and after finishing school, I continued working on freshwater issues and learning about how it's connected to humans. I've been a member of WWF's freshwater team for almost four years. I, preserve, I work on preserving the world's few remaining large and healthy rivers. I love my job because I get to do so many things that I love, including using critical thinking and problem solving skills. I get to spend some time outdoors sometimes, and I get to work with a diverse group of people, and I get to travel to new places and learn about how different people live and use their rivers and freshwater resources. The top image on the left is a picture of me and a rhino um, during a trip I took, took with WWF um, in a country called Nepal. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, and the picture on the right is a photo that shows the majority of my day-to-day -day work. I work mostly at home on my desk, and I have the pleasure of having the best coworker, my dog, which you could see pictured here. Um, and now I'm going to kick off on the topic of rivers and free flowing rivers by asking you all a question. There are four or two photos shown here. Raise your finger one if you think one is a free flowing river. Okay, now put your fingers down. Okay, whoever didn't think it was one, put your fingers up for number two if you think number two is a free flowing river. Okay, 
The answer is number one. If you look at the picture on the left, number one, you can see that the river is flow, flowing, meandering, there's nothing blocking it. In figure two, you could see right in the middle of the photo, there's this gray wall, which is called a dam, and that's blocking the river from it uh, freely flowing. So what is a free flowing river? If a river starts from a mountain and ends at the ocean or the bottom of the slide here, there's nothing blocking it from the start to the end. As you saw in the previous slide, figure one, there was nothing blocking it in here in this figure two, you can see that it starts from the mountains and there's nothing blocking it, at least in this part of the river. <clears throat> So we consider a free flowing river a river that's largely unaffected by human made changes to its flow and connectivity. So in this slide, I'm gonna uh, present to you the four ways of connectivity we think of free flowing rivers in the work that I do. The first way is longitudinally. So traditionally, I always thought about it's a river being free flowing in this way, up and down, there's nothing blocking it and there's connection between the up and downstream. But a dam, like we saw in the previous uh, two slides ago, can block the longitudinal connectivity. Another way to think about a free flowing river um, and its connectivity is laterally, the ability for um, a river to swell and shrink side to side. So think about when there is a storm and the water fills up to the top of the river bank. Where does the water go next? In the way the river is extended side to side and increases its side, allowing for animals and plants to grow in these areas that change depending on how full the river is. However, if people build homes or roads in these areas, then the natural flow of the river is interrupted. The third way we think of connectivity is temporally. Um, and that's the, when there, that's the way that the river changes from time to time. And when there's no dam in a river, the river goes about its natural way. However, when there's a dam built, the river flow um, can be controlled. So you can stop the river from flowing or let it flow um, back out naturally and humans can control that. And the fourth way we think about uh, connectivity is vertically. So the ability to draw or contribute to water to ac the aquifers and atmosphere. So this is the, the surface and below the surface. Um, and that would be, for an example, like groundwater. But if water is taken out of a river and there's not as much water, there won't be as much going to the ground and its connectivity is interrupted. And without all four dimensions of connectivity, like here, the values of rivers are com compromised and they are not considered free flowing. Free flowing rivers have so many benefits. And in the next few slides, I'll dive into these benefits. And I could see in that trivia question before we started, some of these benefits were mentioned. So I'm sure you all have thought about it too. So many spiritual places of practice like churches, mosques, and temples are right next to healthy rivers. So rivers and cultural values are highly connected. Um, in, for example, in a major river in India known as the Ganges River, it's believed that taking a dip into the river will get rid of someone's sorrows and sins. Another benefit is recreation or fun activities or sports that take place on healthy rivers. Think about how you can swim in a river, kayak, look at different birds and animals around the rivers, take walks, um, and then think about rivers that have trash or don't have a lot of river flowing. You probably enjoy the healthy rivers more and they give people peace and allow for fun. Another benefit is the sediment transfer. Free flowing rivers carry nutrients with them as they travel down their path, including sediments. The sediments then end up at the very end of a river and create a pile of dirt known as a delta. The delta protects the area near the river and allows, also allows for food to grow as it acts like a farm for food. So in this image here where you can see the trees are and the pile of dirt, that's the delta. Million and millions of people depend on food from rivers such as fish. Fish need clean rivers unobstructed rivers to be able to move up and down. 
Um, many fish tra actually travel up a river in order to lay their eggs. If there's a dam blocking the path for a fish to go up the river to lay its eggs, the number of fish decreases in the river. Also, many people depend on selling the fish in order to make money for a living. And finally, plants and animals depend on rivers. Not only do animals and plants that live in the rivers, but also animals like the rhino here in this photo depend on rivers to bathe in and as their drinking water source. These are some of the photos I took during my trip to Nepal, like I had mentioned earlier with the photo with this rhino I had. Um, the photo on the left is a photo of a garial. It's a really ancient um, species similar to um, crocodiles. So they live in these waters and depend on healthy rivers to survive. And then the rhinos, they also depend on rivers to bathe in and drink water from. But freshwater ecosystems are at risk. According to a report put together by WWF since 1970, or about 50 years ago when the freshwater species were beginning to be tracked, um, freshwater species have been declining 83%. And that's more than land and ocean species. Land and ocean species are decreasing also, but the freshwater is at a faster rate. So what are some of these biggest threats? One is pollution. This could be in the form of trash or chemicals or anything that goes into the system and makes the water unsafe to drink or use. Another, maybe you've heard of climate change. There are now more extreme natural disasters. In some regions of the world, there's more rain in a concentrated period, and in other parts of the world, there's a lack of water and prolonged drought, kind of like how I explained where I grow up, there's a lot of droughts. Another is water use and how we use water. Humans use a lot of water, especially to grow food, which is, of course, very important, but we can improve how and how much water we use. Lastly, poorly planned infrastructure. As the water tries to expand access to electricity and make roads and the world more connected, infrastructure has to be built. However, there are many cases when, where the infrastructure is not built in a way where it's best for the humans and the environment. And now that I've presented on the threats and some sad statistics, I wanted to brighten the mood with some solutions. As I mentioned many times throughout my presentation, one of the major threats for free flowing rivers are the construction of infrastructure like dams built on the wrong rivers. It's, it's no doubt that we need this infrastructure to survive and thrive, um, but there's a lot of different ways to access um, these solutions and access to electricity and keep rivers healthy and free flowing. One solution is to plan wisely and how you build a dam on a river. Some questions you can think or ask are, how will the dam impact fish and other animals? Is it reliable given water availability and its reliability changing due to climate change? Some other forms of preserving important rivers are to protect them by law or have citizens and organizations get involved and voice their opinions on the importance of rivers. Other solutions include using other types of energy systems such as solar and wind power instead of hydropower to meet energy demands. In fact, renewable energy, such uh, especially uh, solar energy, is globally more affordable now than other traditional forms of energy. So times are changing. Even now, people are thinking of other innovative ways to meet human demands, but also keep nature thriving. So now that you've learned about rivers and their importance, what can you do? So one easy way is to attend a river cleanup day. A lot of communities have smaller organizations that plan events around rivers, like river cleanup day, or if you live around a beach, maybe beach cleanup day, and you can attend one. It's a good way to keep your river clean, but also meet others who care and want to keep their river clean. Another, what you've probably heard is reuse, reduce, recycle. You've probably heard this one. And um, in the context of rivers and waters, some ways you can lessen your impact are taking shorter showers, turning off the faucet when you brush your teeth. Um, and other ways, everywhere is a little different, um, whether you live in an apartment, a home, a dry place, a wet place. 
Uh, there are changes that you can make to impact and reduce your impact to water resources. Another way is to tell others about your river. Some people may not know the importance of rivers or that they even have a river in their community and how they can protect it. And lastly, visit and enjoy your river. The more people who care and use the river, the more attention there will be around keeping the river healthy and for all who depend on them. And I'm sure maybe you can think of some other ways that I didn't present here. And with that, I'm going to finish up my presentation and hear the questions from you all. I thank you very much for listening to me and I am excited to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was great. We are going to get started with the Q&A part now. So just last reminder to those watching from the website, use that form to place your questions for Natalie. Um, we're going to start with our groups that are joining us on camera. So we're going to go in the same order that we did the introduction. So when it's your turn, make sure you get up nice and loudly in front of the camera so we can be sure to hear your question. So we're going to start with our group from Academy of the Sacred Heart. You all are up first. So your first question for Natalie, please. Who has first question? Natalie? Um, what is your favorite river to visit? What was the question? What is my favorite river that I visited? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm. That's a tough one. I mean, I've seen some healthy rivers in um, Nepal, like I mentioned, that was really cool. Um, I've also seen some really beautiful rivers in a small, another small country called Armenia. So I would say those, those rivers probably the ones that gush from the mountains and you could see them fresh from the start of their source. Okay, next up is our group from East Jordan Elementary. What is your first question for Natalie? Nice and loudly for us it's here. How many years have you studied to become a freshwater bio biologist? I went to school for about six years, but probably you could study for four, so maybe four years total, the two years of general education, um, two years of undergraduate and two years of graduate. Okay, moving on to Ms. Kudrick's class. You all are up next. What is your first question? Okay. All right. Who wants to come on over? Okay, come on over. He's coming. <laughs> What was your favorite like trip? My favorite trip. Um, I recently went to um, Bangkok, Thailand for a workshop. And I don't know if I would say it was my favorite, but it was the first time I got to travel in about three years because of COVID and the pandemic. So it was really nice to see coworkers and um, discuss on the Mekong River. Okay, next up is our Green Heron group. Hey, pick up. Yep. No, no, go up. Okay, our creek is what they call a drowned river mouth. There is a natural dam made by a sand bar. This year, the sand bar washed away. How will that change our ecosystem? The sandbar got washed away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. To I'm sure there are many answers, but to my mind, a sandbar can protect your coastal um, area from flooding. So let's just say the water comes in. I'm assuming from Lake Ontario into the river, and it can cause flooding. Um, it could cause more turbidity, so muddier water. Um, the the sandbar is really great for protection. So I think those are some of the impacts you might experience. Okay, we're gonna take a couple questions from the website and then we'll start up with another round from our on-camera. 
camera groups here. So the first question from Mrs. Dodson's fourth grade class in Manville, New Jersey, they'd like to know what is your favorite part of your job? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I really like the people I work with um, at WWF. People are pretty passionate about protecting the environment. And so it is motivating and inspiring to work with um, such a motivated group every day. Okay, another interesting question here um, from Bridget in Orlando. She wanted to know what was the last animal on your slide? Oh, a river dolphin. Yeah, so river dolphins, they're, they're only found in a few parts of the world. And this was one in the Irrawaddy River in a country called Cambodia and Asia. And there's actually about 80 of them left, I believe, because of dams and other threats. They've been um, dying a lot. So like WWF works really hard on these uh, river dolphins to protect them. There's a few other species, but yeah, they're really cute. I have never seen one yet, but I hope to see one someday. <laughs> okay, I think we're ready for our next round of questions from our on-camera groups here. So we'll start back up with the Academy of the Sacred Heart. We'll bring them back in for their next question. So okay. Are there more free-flowing rivers or more non-free-flowing rivers? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so if you look at really small rivers, um, there's a lot more free-flowing. Like if you can think about a couple of feet, um, they're free-flowing because you can't put a dam or it's, it's so small that you can't have that strong of an impact on. But in terms of really long, like the ones you think about, you maybe see in movies or you've seen, I showed pictures of, there's very few left. That's why we work really hard on um, protecting them. There are a lot more longer big rivers that are not free flowing. Okay, let's go to our Red Devils at East Jordan Elementary. I'm sorry, I could not hear that question. What advice would you give to students who want careers working outside? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I think that in school, if you have clubs or um, as you get further and further closer to graduating school, just um, engaging, volunteering, um, asking your teachers about how you can get involved. Um, some of the best ways I learned what I don't want to do is by doing it and learning it that way. Um, so ask your teachers, ask your parents. Um, I'm sure you all use the internet um, to see what's nearby you. Um, and, and that way too, you can talk to and meet people who do do careers and outdoors and that's the best way to learn about it, meet others. That was a great question. Okay, Mrs. Kudrick's class, you are up next. Oh. Um, Wait, right here, guys. Have you ever been to the Delaware River? Come on over Okay, a little bit louder. I'm have you ever make... been to the Delaware River? Um, I have not. And tell her why it's important. Go ahead. It's a... If the Delaware River at, ever had a dam, what would happen to it? Right. Tell her it's free, free flowing. Tell her it's Because it's free flowing. Okay. So if there was a dam belt on the Delaware River, I'm not too familiar about the geography, but um, it could potentially displace people. So if there are people who are living by the river, they might have to move away because um, if you build a dam, then it could create, like I said, laterally, it would um, increase, which would cause people's homes to flood. So that's one potential impact. The other could be the health of the river. and 
um, like the sediments that carry down, they could be stuck. So no longer would it be providing nutrients downstream. It could also impact the animals, the fish going up and down to lay their eggs. Um, any bigger animals too would be pretty impacted since they need more room to go up and down. Um, the water quality would probably um, lessen. So if you use the river for drinking water, it might not be feasible anymore to use it as drinking water. So those are just some of the impacts that could happen. Um, there's a lot more, but I will stop there. Good question. Okay, our green heron group from Ontario. You are up next. Go Dan. Um, if a dam is removed, how long before a river would repair itself? Good question. I don't have a straightforward answer for you because each river is unique in its own way but nature is very resilient. It bounces back very quickly. So um, you would see like abundance of animals or plants growing and pretty quickly, probably within the year, you can see some significant changes, but it depends on um, the, the actual river. There's one really good example about a dam, dam removal in um, Maine, I believe, in the Pen Pembiscot River. So if you're interested and want to look that up, there are some really cool videos and um, example of how the dam was removed there and life came back to it pretty quickly. Okay, we are doing great on time. So I'm gonna ask a couple more from the website and then we'll do one last round with our groups on screen here. So we had a good question come in from Isabel at Prairie Creek Community School in Castle Rock, Minnesota. She wanted to know what happens to a river after a drought? So <laughs> after a drought, you don't have a, a whole lot of river, right? Naturally, if you have the precipitation, the rainfall, the snow that melts and it's no longer there, it causes, it can cause the temperature to, be, to become warmer in a river, right? Because you have a lot less river. Um, and that could cause animals to die because they need a certain temperature to live, also plants. Um, it can cause like uh, issues to like the people and communities who depend on them if they use it to water their plants or to drink, then they don't have enough. They have to come up with different solutions. Um, it could cause the flow to really change. So you don't have those sediments coming in as much because you don't have the river flowing as fast. Um, yeah, the water quality would be affected because if you have even just like a little bit of contaminants and not enough water, it would be more concentrated with that pollutant. Um, there's a lot of other impacts, but I will again stop there since there are so many. Another interesting question that we had come through um, is a little bit more about kind of natural solutions to pollution. So Giselle in Maryland wanted to know if adding mussels can actually help clean rivers. Good question. Again, it depends on where you live. Um, if, if historically there have been mussels in a certain river or estuary system, then yes, that could be a solution, but you have to be careful and make sure it's not invasive or you're not adding like a mussel that's never been there because they can cause more harm um, if they've never been there and shouldn't be there. So it really depends on the river system. Maybe the river you're talking about, um, that's a feasible solution. Okay, we have time for one last round of questions. So we'll go back up to our Academy of the Sacred Heart group in Missouri. This will be your last question for Natalie. Allison? Is the Missouri River and Mississippi River free flowing? No, it is not, unfortunately, but it is the longest river in um, the continental United States. Um, and it is pretty long. It goes all the way pretty much from the border of Canada all the way out 
through the Gulf. So um, it is a powerful river, but it is not free flowing, unfortunately. Okay, East Jordan Elementary. Your Hi. turn. Go ahead. Do you feel hopeful that our biggest water problems can be solved? <laughs> yeah, great question. Absolutely. It's, you know, the work is sometimes can be sad, like the statistics I shared with you and all the threats. But if there's no hope, then there wouldn't be, you know, it doesn't feel like there'd be a point to work on this. I'd be like, oh, well, it's all going to be bad anyways. But there's a lot of solutions that are being discussed and a lot of new technology, um, a lot more information we have now because of science and more people working on it. So I feel very help, hopeful. And there's a lot of good, successful stories too on um, areas where I've walked, there have been really good solutions and they are better off. So yeah, I do feel hopeful. Okay, Mrs. Kudrick's class, you are up. What is your last question? <laughs> No. Our class wants to invite you to discover the Delaware River, which flows for 282 miles, and we just want and we want you to come and check out the river. Awesome! I would love to. Okay, and last but certainly not least, our Green Herons from Niagara Region. What is your last question? What is your favorite freshwater animal? I like fish and turtles from what I've seen. I, I haven't seen the river dolphin, but I have a feeling when I see them, they might be my favorite. Okay, and we have time for just a couple more. We'll take some from the chat and then we'll wrap things up here. So um, we had a question come in here from um, Ella at Prairie Creek Community School that wants to know how long does it take for a stream to become a river? What is the difference? Okay, good question. So usually we think of a stream that's smaller Technically, it is still a river. It's just um, the way we talk about it is a stream, a creek gets smaller, it has less water. I don't know that there is a strict definition to when it becomes a river, um, but just generally when it's larger and it's considered a river. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a more direct answer for you. Okay, and I think this question here will be a good one to end on from David in Charleston, South Carolina, wants to know what we can do in our local community to support your efforts to remove dams. Okay. Um, if you use the internet and you're allowed to, I would check out the WWF website. There's sometimes like virtual um, petition so you can sign your name in support of removing a dam or protecting a river from having a dam built. Um, so that's how you could probably most easiest support WWF and also just learn about it, um, share with others. Like I mentioned, it's just important to get the word out. And in your own community, just go to river cleanups and also, you know, there's sometimes really local organizations and working with them and being involved in whatever they're doing. They can all help in the bigger cause. Okay, so before we officially bring everyone back in one last time to say goodbye, um, I have a little bit of information that I just wanted to share with folks here, especially teachers and parents, if you're interested. Um, we do have some educational resources on the Conservation in the Classroom website to go along with Natalie's presentation all about freshwater and free flowing rivers. So to be sure to check that out. You'll find the supplemental material packet that contains different bell ringer questions, Kahoot quizzes, links to different wild classroom materials, including those inside of our freshwater dolphin toolkit. And there's also a really cool 
cool app that I would encourage all of you to check out. It's called WWF Free Rivers. It's an augmented reality app where it kind of turns your learning space into a free flowing river so you can really see the benefits and impacts. And then mark your calendars for our next event coming up in February on the 9th at 1.30 Eastern. We're going to be celebrating women in science. I think we've kind of kicked that off already today with Natalie, but um, to celebrate International Day of Women and Girls in Science on February 11th, we are going to be joined by two members of the WWF Arctic team, Alexis Will, who is a marine biologist, and Elizabeth Kruger, who is an Arctic conservationist. So to be sure to join us for that. And without further ado, I think we are ready to wrap up. So let's bring everybody in one last time. Natalie, thank you so much for for joining us today and teaching us about rivers and play flowing rivers.